So there you go. Big smile on my face. We have made it. Those who are listening on the audio experience on iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher on the recording, you will have no idea um, of the technical issues that we just experienced at 9pm tonight on this Monday night. I want to give a massive shout out again to everybody who has come back. Gary, Rachel, Sharon, Inez, Dara, Lindsay, uh, Paul, Gemma, Kim, Dougal, Tony, Amy, Stu, Lowry, um, John, Kim, I've probably said Kim, everybody, just everybody, thanks so much for coming back basically, yeah, we had some issues there, but this is a really important topic that I want to talk about tonight, and I think it's freaking interesting as hell, um, the spin on it that we're going to look at tonight, and, and I just think, uh, yeah, it was worth persevering, Alex Hewitt just joined, Bernard's here as well, it's worth per- uh, it was worth persevering. Uh, through that little tech hiccup to get us to this point. Um, so to begin with, yeah, um, I'll try and cut the intro down now. We've just lost 20 minutes. I discovered a book this week through listening to a mentor of mine. You know, I'm big on having mentors in in our lives, you know, in every area of our lives, business, physicality, acting, everything. You know, literally, the more mentors you can have who are between five and 25 years ahead of you in what you want to achieve, I think the better you just learn from these guys so quickly. And I was listening to a, uh, a guy called Steve who was interviewing this guy called Johan Hari. I think that's how you say his name. Um, and Johan had written a book a couple of, I think it might even be like a couple of years ago now, um, called Lost Connections, which I'm going to throw up on the screen now, uh, which is this book, Johan Hari, Lost Connections. Um, it says, Uncovering uh, the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions. And this this is a super, super fascinating take on ultimately why so many people in society are walking around rather unhappy right now. And I've just seen a lot of actors really open up on mental health. Like over the last like 18 months, to be honest, it's become really like uh, prevalent in terms of people. I don't think necessarily maybe, well, maybe it is on the rise in terms of it's maybe never been you know, unhappiness within this industry, depression within the industry might never have been as high, or maybe people are just talking about it a lot more now. Um, and this book kind of explores that as well um, and explores the real causes of it. And it challenges a lot of traditional opinion on what causes depression, particularly clinical depression in terms of people being deficient in uh, hormones like serotonin, um, etc. things that we, you know, have established over the years or have we established over the years have the pharmaceutical companies established over the years that it's a lack of serotonin so that people fill their bodies full of synthetic serotonin and the pharmaceutical companies make a shitload of money um it questions a lot of stuff like this amy forrest in the house uh, hello amy valerie's here as well thanks for joining us um and I want to read you tonight because this is effectively bringing the book club back. Not done a book club for quite a while. I'm going to read you um, just the prologue, really, to this book um, because it's super cheap, and I think everyone should just go and buy it on Amazon. It was like five ninety nine, I think, for the paperback, the Kindle version that I've got. I bought both of them because I like to hold a book. This Kindle version here, Lost Collection, was like four ninety nine. I'm going to play you guys um, a video after this. I'm going to read you the prologue, basically a little, which has just got a really powerful message in it. Um, and then I'm going to play you a 25-minute interview that Johan did uh, with a chap called, I've his name down here, uh, what's his name? Benjamin Ram from a place called opendemocracy.net um, because I think it can kind of summarize a lot of what the book's about really quickly. And I'm all about kind of getting people information that they can act on, act on this, quickly. So I think that's going to be the best way to do it. And then if you want, we'll look at another chapter of this book um, next week. Um, before I read you this, anybody heard of this book before? Anyone heard of Johan? Anybody? I mean, this guy's like, he lives in London. He's got a, um, you know, a foreign sounding name, but he's, he's British, lives in London, very successful author. This book is an international bestseller now. It's got on the front cover a review, well, like little... Um, snippets from people like Elton John says this amazing book will change your life uh, Hillary Clinton called it wonderful um it's just it's just got such a claim and I can't believe I've not heard of it really until this week but anybody else heard of it anyone else read it um you know would be interesting and anybody got any opinions on this to begin with in terms of causes of depression um is it on the rise is it due to societal things right now is social media playing a part was it on the rise before the internet and before social media? Um, you know, have you had issues maybe yourself? Um, 
fascinating. Share whatever you want to share in the comments on uh, on Facebook. What I might do as well, I think I don't know if I've set this off. Oh yeah, I have set it off on Twitter. So those those on Twitter, if you watch on Twitter, um, apologies, I, I, I can't keep an eye on your comments. Um, come over to Facebook. If Johan is watching on Twitter, the author of the book, definitely come over to Facebook. And I want you on a podcast for on this.tv. Um, it's facebook.com forward slash ats on this TV. You'll find this video that you're watching on Twitter at the top of the Facebook feed um, right now. Uh, Eno says, yes, Mr. Harry has been discussed a lot. There's some disagreement about his views on the subject of depressions. It's interesting, isn't it? There's just so many different, you know, viewpoints but i just found this really interesting and i run a program for actors which is um you know nothing scientific in terms of uh you know on a clinical level um but has got a lot of science uh backed positive psychology behind it called their uh, bulletproof actor go to bulletproofactor.com if you want to find out more about that um some of the things that Johan talks about here makes a lot of what i go through in the program in bulletproof actor make sense as well about why people tell me that's so um effective for them over like say just masking people's issues with synthetic hormones and going you know what if you're feeling bad take all these happy pills you're going to feel great um and then the tolerance of those pills goes up so the dose goes up and up and up and up till they're maxed out and then they're still not feeling fulfilled because ultimately you know the hormones are just masking a problem in terms of these people's habits outlooks things that have happened to them they haven't dealt with properly um it's a really interesting uh interesting kind of take on it but i'm just going to read you this prologue it's you'll you'll think it's kind of completely off topic but it's actually the message at the very end of this that i want you to take away from this because uh, there's there's a reason why what i just said about masking you know uh, masking symptoms um, is so prevalent in society today and why actually when we're feeling bad we probably shouldn't want to mask those symptoms. We should want to actually go, wait a minute, we're getting these for a reason. This is my body or my mind's way of telling me something's wrong. and I need to change things up in a bigger way. But let's listen to this really interesting story. It says, one evening in the spring of 2014, I was walking down a small side street in central Hanoi when on a stall uh, by the side of the road, I saw an apple. It was freakishly large and red and inviting. I'm terrible at haggling, so I paid $3 for this single piece of fruit and carried it into my room in the very charming Hanoi Hotel. Like any good foreigner who's read his health warnings, I washed the apple diligently with bottled water. But as I bit into it, I felt a bitter chemical taste fill my mouth. It was the flavor I imagined back when I was a kid that all food was going to um, have after nuclear war. I knew I should stop, but I was too tired to go out for any other food. So I ate half and then I set it aside, repelled. Two hours later, the stomach pains began. For two days, I sat in my room as it began to spin around me faster and faster. But I wasn't worried. I'd been through food poisoning before. I knew the script. You just have to drink water and let it pass you through and let it pass through you. On the third day, though, I realized my time in Vietnam was slipping away in this sickness blur. I was there to track down some survivors of the war for another book project I'm working on. So I called my translator, Dang Huang Lin. I have no idea if that's how you say their name. And told him he should drive deep into the countryside in the south. We should dive deep into the countryside in the south, as we'd planned all along. As we travelled around a trashed hamlet here and an Agent or Orange victim there, I was starting to feel steadier on my feet. The next morning, he took me to the hut of a tiny 87-year-old woman. Her lips were dyed bright red from the herb she was chewing, and she pulled herself towards me across the floor on a wooden plank that someone had managed to attach some wheels to. Throughout the war, she explained, she'd spent nine years wandering from bomb to bomb, trying to keep her kids alive. They were the only survivors from her village. And she, as she was speaking, I started to experience something strange. Her voice seemed to be uh, coming from very far away and the room appeared to be moving around me uncontrollably. Then quite unexpectedly, I started to explode all over her hut like a bomb of vomit and feces. <laughs> Shouldn't have had the apple, man. When some time later I, be uh, I became aware of my surroundings again, the old woman was looking at me with what seemed to be sad eyes. This boy needs to go to a hospital, she said. He is very sick. No, no, I insisted. I'd lived in East London on a staple diet of fried chicken for years, so this wasn't my first time at the E. coli rodeo. I told Dang to drive me back to Hanoi so I could recover in my hotel room in front of CNN and the contents of my own stomach for a few more days. No, the old woman said firmly. The hospital. Look, Johan, Dang said, this is the only person with her kids who survived nine years of American bombs in a village. I'm going to listen to her health advice over yours. 
He dragged me into his car and I heaved and convulsed all the way to a sparse building that I learned later had been built by the Soviets decades before. I was the first uh, foreigner ever to be treated there. From inside, a group of nurses, half excited and half baffled, rushed me um, and carried me to a table where they immediately started shouting. Dang was yelling back at the nurses and they were shrieking now in a language that had no words I could recognise. I noticed then that they had put something tight around my arm. I also noticed that in the corner there was a little girl with a nose in plaster alone. She looked at me, I looked back. We were the only patients in the room. As soon as they got the results of my blood pressure, dangerously low, the nurse said as Dang translated, uh, they started, uh, they, the nurse said as Dang translated, they started jabbing needles into me. Later, Dang told me that he had falsely said that I was a very important person from the West and that if I died there, it would be a source of shame for the people of Vietnam. This went on for 10 minutes as my arm got heavy with tubes and track marks. Then they started to shout questions at me about my symptoms through Dang. It was a seemingly endless list about the nature of my pain. As all of this was unfolding, I felt strangely split. Part of me was consumed with nausea. Everything was spinning so fast. And I kept thinking, stop moving, stop moving, stop moving. But another part of me, below or beneath or beyond this, was conducting a quite rational little monologue. Oh, you're close to death. Felled by a poisoned apple. You're like Eve or Snow White or Alan Turing. Then I thought, is your last thought really going to be that pretentious? Then I thought, if eating half an apple did this to you, what do these chemicals do to the farmers who work in the fields with them day in, day out for years? That's got to be a good story someday. Then I thought, you shouldn't be thinking like this if you're on the brink of death. You should be thinking of profound moments in your life. You should be having flashbacks when you've been truly happy. I picture myself as a small boy lying on the bed in our old house with my grandmother cuddling up to her and watching the British soap opera Coronation Street. I picture myself years later when I was looking after my little nephew as he woke up to me at seven in the morning and lay next to me on the bed and asked me long and serious questions about life. I picture myself lying on another bed when I was 17 with the first person I ever fell in love with. It wasn't a sexual memory, just lying there being held. Wait, I thought, have you only ever been happy lying in bed? What does this reveal about you? Then this internal monologue was eclipsed by a heave. I begged the doctors to give me something that would switch off this extreme nausea. Dang talked animatedly with the doctors. Then he told me, finally, the doctors say you need your nausea. I'll say that again, right? The doctors say you need your nausea. It's a message. And we must listen to the message. It will tell us what is wrong with us. The doctor says you need your nausea. It is a message and we must listen to the message. It will tell us what is wrong with you. And with that, I began to vomit again. Many hours later, a doctor, a man in his 40s, came into my field of vision and said, we've learned that your kidneys have stopped working. You're extremely dehydrated because of the vomiting and diarrhea. You've not absorbed any water for a very long time. So you're, a, uh, so you're like a man who has been wandering in the desert for days. Dang interjected. He says if we had driven you back to Hanoi, you would have died on the journey. Good call that they made the call to go to the hospital. The doctor told me to list everything I'd eaten for three days. It was a short list, an apple. He looked at me quizzically. Was it a clean apple? Yes, I said. I washed it in bottled water. Everyone burst out laughing as if I'd served up a killer Chris Rock punchline. Turns out that you can't just wash an apple in Vietnam. They're covered in pesticides so they can stand for months without rotting. You need to cut off the peel entirely or this can happen to you. Although I couldn't understand why all through the time I was working on this book, I kept thinking of something that doctor said to me that day during my unglamorous hour of poisoning. You need your nausea. It's a message. It will tell us what is wrong with you. It only became clear to me why in a very different place, thousands of miles away, at the end of my journey into what really causes depression and anxiety and how we can find our way back. Now, we're going to discover that in the book. But ultimately, that, that first bit before I play this interview now, is just the importance of listening ultimately to your body, whether you're sick, you know, like he is vomiting, you know, you want to ignore that and go, no, no, I'll just be fine. I'll just get in the car and drive me back. No, he would have just died, you know, you know, take some, I don't know, paracetamol, get rid of the pain or whatever. It doesn't actually take the problem away. Antidepressants, yeah, might fill you full of serotonin or whatever, but from my experience, I've not, I've not been on them, but from my experience of friends who, who have taken them, um, you know, people close to me in my life. Um, it's not the solution. It's literally just like putting a Band-Aid on it, it's just putting a plaster on it. Um, and then it's, it stops that feeling for a little while, but that feeling, that nausea, the equivalent of, you know, to this story, is there for a reason. It's telling you, if you are feeling like this, 
um, then something is wrong. And personally, and what we're going to hear in this interview now, um, I think it's taking action, changing habits, putting yourself in environments where you can thrive that will really cure you know, this kind of depression epidemic that seems to be happening right now. Um, and Johan's take on it is really interesting. So I'm going to play you that now. It's about 25 minutes long. Um, but before I do, I'm just going to check out some comments because obviously I was reading the uh, I was reading the book there. Uh, oh God, there's loads of comments. Um, so Gary says, pharma companies won't tell you, don't know how their own tablets work, <laughs> right? I think it was already on the rise, but I think social media has made it even worse, says Alex. Well, you're going to hear in this interview, Alex, why social media has potentially made it worse. I think it's always been prevalent, says Kim, but um, our fast-paced, high-pressure lifestyle is definitely impacting it more. Dougal says, I think it's always been there. It's just that we can express ourselves more these days. And also social media is a good way to uh, for some to vent. Yeah, absolutely. Social media can be a, a positive thing as well. Helen says, I'm holding a cacao ceremony in London on March 24th. If anyone's feeling low right now, great way for you to come back to your heart. What? Eat some cacao. High, that's high in serotonin. Um, Rachel, thanks uh, for that, Helen. Rachel says, I think depression is more openly shared now. So many tragedies through suicide in our generation. Yeah, it's still, you know, it's something that I don't think people talk about, but like, they need to talk about it more. It's, it literally is like the biggest killer, isn't it? Particularly like, you know, young males. Um, John says, in my own view, exercise can help and produce serotonin, but the core issue can be a combination of physical and non-physical around depression. Um, Rachel says, you've got to listen to your body. If it aches, you're not well. If you're mentally tired and exhausted, you need to take care of yourself. Yeah, it's the same thing, isn't it? I wish we we need like we need a different term for mental health because mental health has a, has this weird connotation attached to it that it's like for weak people or weird. It's just like whereas physical health doesn't have that. Going oh, you know I'm working on my physical health. People are like, oh yeah nice good for you get in the gym well done. What are you doing? Well, if you go and working on my mental health, people are a bit like oh okay right clearly must be something wrong with you or you know it's it's weird isn't it? We need like a new a new term for it. Uh, you've not missed too much, Bobby, because we had a 20-minute uh, technical difficulty. Um, right, so this interview, 25 minutes long, you're going to see Johan in this. You're going to see why I want him on a podcast. Um, you're going to hear a lot of uh, really interesting points from the book that we can look at in more detail on future book clubs if you want, or just buy the book. Like I said, it's about six quid on Amazon. Um, and... Yeah, I think you're going to enjoy it. It's with Benjamin Ram. He's from a website. I've got to give them credit because it's technically just nicking their content, but hopefully they're cool with that. Um, opendemocracy.net. Uh, Benjamin Ram, R-A-M-M, is uh, is doing this interview. Um, but you'll see Johan's so freaking articulate and he won't stop talking. He would be an absolutely perfect, uh, a total perfect podcast guest. And this so relates to uh, to actors. Amy says, Mormons suffer from ill mental health and not accepted help. I always thought it was silly to think it would affect me, but has uh, as but has this year started therapy. Best thing I've ever done. I think everyone should have therapy. Like, you know, all therapy is is just talking. Talking through what's going on in your life. Like, it should be completely accepted. But again, we need to call it something else because it's got this weird stigma attached to it that it's that you know this is therapy for me i jump on here on a monday night and just tell all you guys what's going on in my life what's going on in my business what's going on in my acting career it's proper therapy um and it's bringing back that connection you know with the uh with the community helen says look up cacao calling on facebook something i've not i've, I've never looked at uh helen but uh but thank you um says 100 percent raw ceremonial grade cacao has a profound effect on your mind and body contains a host of healthy things including serotonin dopamine minerals and antioxidants really interesting Johan has also an interesting ted talk which you can watch on youtube says an a um and uh amy says always thought it was too expensive but actually just as important as physical health mental health is everything it's more important than physical health because it's for, for me it's the thing that enables me to be motivated enough to go to the gym and work on my physical health um that's why i run on a sunday it's just me and my mind it's brilliant for my mental health and physical health at the same time here's the interview I can still see the comments as we're going through it. Um, let's watch it together, and I'll jump back on at the end for a little uh, a little recap. I think you're going to enjoy it. All right, I'll see you soon. 25 minutes. See you then. Johan Hari is an award-winning journalist and the author of the New York Times best-selling book, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. His new book, Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions, challenges many of the myths surrounding mental health. Johan? Good to see you. Thanks Hi, for mate. speaking to Open Democracy. Great to be with you again. Um, you write here that you grew up, like me, in the age of Prozac. 
And there's a very interesting line. You say that the dominant idea at that time was that everything was all in the head. Either that you were imagining uh, depression or anxiety, or that there was a chemical malfunction, that the brain was like a machine, it wasn't working, and that drugs, Prozac, would be able to correct that. Why are you so keen to challenge that? There were really two mysteries that were uh, troubling me, that were really playing, going around in my head that I wanted to solve. And I actually put it off a long time. It's a, it's a, weird, it's a sign of how much, I, how resistant I was to looking at this, that I actually found it easier to go and meet uh, hitmen for the Mexican drug cartels and spend time with them for my previous book than to delve into the story. Because if you're delving into the story about your pain, yeah. that's, a very, that's something you approach with great caution. Sure. And so, like you say, when I was a teenager, I'd, I'd gone to my doctor and I'd said, you know, uh, I feel like I have this this pain leaking out of me. I don't understand why. And my doctor told me a story, you know, height of the age of Prozac, story was being told to loads of people watching this. It's still being told to people every day, mm. which was there's this chemical called serotonin. It makes people feel good. You're clearly lacking it. That's why you feel like this. Um, and these drugs will boost it and then you'll feel back to normal. And I felt a tremendous sense of relief when I was told that story. And I did, in fact, start taking the drugs. Um, and I remember feeling a tremendous sense of relief for several months and feeling a lot better. And then this sense of pain starting to kind of bleed back through. So I went back to the doctor. The doctor said, clearly we haven't given you a high enough dose. We'll give you a higher one. Felt better again for a brief period. Then the kind of sense of pain came back. And I was locked in that kind of pattern until I was taking the maximum dose, which I did with a few short breaks for 13 years. And the first mystery for me was, well, why am I still depressed? Mm -hmm. Right? I'm doing everything. I, according to this story, I'm doing everything that I should be doing, and yet the pain is still there. The second mystery was, why are there so many other people like me? Like when, I remember when I was a kid and some of the people in my family had taken some psychiatric meds. That was very unusual, right? I, you, I didn't see other kids' families doing that. And a funny thing happened as I got older, which is the whole of Western civilization caught up with my family. Today, one in five Americans is taking a psychiatric drug at any given time. In Britain, one in 11 people is taking an antidepressant at any given time. We're near the top of the international league tables. Even people who aren't taking them, you are in fact ingesting them because they're in the water supply because so many of us take them and, and urinate them out. So. The second mystery to me was, why are so many other people depressed? And it seems that uh, every time I thought about it, I would tentatively think, well, look, it can't be that just everyone is having some spontaneous chemical imbalance in their brains all at the same time. Mm -hmm. There must be something else going on here. And yet at the same time, we're so deep in this story that it was it's hard to see beyond it. So I ended up, for the for Lost Connections, I ended up going on this very long journey over 40,000 miles. I wanted to talk to the world's leading scientists about this. Uh, and I wanted to talk to people who had radically different perspectives from a, an Amish village in Indiana where there's extremely low depression to, you know, a Berlin housing project where people have found this extraordinary way to overcome depression to uh, a city in Brazil that had banned advertising to see if it made people feel better to, you know, um, uh, a lab in Baltimore where they're giving people psychedelics to see if it helped with, with, with these problems. And I guess the, the thing that I, I learned is that the, the, the story we've been told about depression is not true. There's a very different story that leads to very different solutions, very different what I would call real antidepressants. There's a very intriguing anecdote at the, the beginning of the book in, in, in Vietnam that I'm not going to spoil for any future <laughs> readers. It's quite graphic, but you say you, um, you, you become very ill and a doctor tells you uh, a, a line that runs throughout the book. You need your nausea. It is a message. It will tell you what's wrong with you. I mean, how do you think that our culture has been willing to take on the story of chemical imbalance to repress other elements that people feel anxious or are rightly critical about? Well, the, the, the story about uh, the depression is mainly caused by chemical imbalance. Firstly, it's just not true. This is one of the things that most shocked me. You go and talk to scientists. Dr. David Healy, who's one of the leading British scientists who writes about this, said to me, you know, you can't even say that story has been discredited because it was never credited. There was never a time when half of the scientists in the field thought it. It's essentially a kind of propaganda story that was ginned up by the, the drug companies. Not everything I disagree with is just propaganda from the drug companies, but that was. You know, um, uh, Professor Andrew Scull at Princeton says, I think the phrase he uses is, he's written, it's deeply misleading and unscientific to say low serotonin causes depression. So this story I was told is just not true. And I think the, the, the main, there are many dangers of the chemical imbalance story. So the first thing is, it has led us to solutions which are not working for the vast majority of people. Between 65 and 80% of people taking antidepressants are depressed again within a year. 
So this is not about saying anything should be taken off the menu, it's not about attacking chemical antidepressants, but this, this should never be the only thing we offer on the menu because it doesn't work for most people, right? It leaves most people depressed. We need to have a different kind of conversation. But to me, the, the, the biggest problem with the, uh, it took me a long time to see this, biggest problem with the chemical imbalance story is it says to everyone who's depressed and anxious, you're a machine with a broken part. Whereas actually, the truth is, we're human beings with unmet needs. When I looked at, there are real biological factors that can make you more sensitive to those needs. But when I looked at the evidence, and I, you know, I, in the book I give these nine proven causes of depression and anxiety, seven of which are in the way we live. One of the things that most uh, struck me is there was this thing that, that, that can, we've been told this is a problem in our skulls. It's largely a problem in specific aspects of the way we live. And one of the things that, that, that really struck me is there was something that kind of connected these different uh, uh, causes of, of, of uh, depression and anxiety, which is, the best way to explain it is, everyone knows that human beings have, you know, physical needs, right? We need shelter, we need warmth, we need food and so on. There's very strong evidence that we all have psychological needs. There's things we need to be psychologically healthy human beings. We need to feel we belong. We need, to feel we're, we need to feel we're valued. We need to feel we have meaning and purpose in our lives. Um, there's a whole range of them. And there's very good evidence that our culture, which is very good at many things, is decreasingly good at meeting people's underlying psychological needs. And this is why we're, we're showing this, this distress. Certainly my doctor made me feel, and I know lots of other people feel like this, that, that, our, that this depression and anxiety is a pathology in the individual. Um, actually, these are meaningful signals that our culture has gone wrong. Now, we all know that. I was thinking about this by analogy the other day. I, uh, um, as you know, I spend a lot of my time in the US, and one thing that never fails to shock me in the US is the ubiquity among perfectly sane people of indigestion tablets, right? Um, whereas any European, if you try to explain to a French person what an indigestion tablet is, they're just completely bad, because they just go, well, but indigestion is a signal from your body yeah. that you're eating too fast and that you need to slow down, right? It's actually a very wise, evolved process uh, because, of course, eating too much makes you sick. Um, in a similar way, depression is a necessary signal that something has gone wrong with the way we're living, right? Now, that doesn't mean it's a good feeling, and I'm not a stoic. It doesn't mean I'm saying, well, we're there, but we need to learn to bear it. Any more than I think we need to learn to bear indigestion. It's, the, it's a signal that something needs to change. 87% of people are dissatisfied with their work environment and that they spend large periods of their life in that environment and that it would be strange with that not to take a toll on their mental health. Can you just tell us a little more about the importance of meaningful work? The Gallup poll is actually even worse than you said so. It, asked, it was the most detailed study that's ever been done of how people feel about their work. And what it found is 13% of people like their work, enjoy it, get energy from it, kind of our relationship to our work. Um, I think it was 63% are what they called sleepwalking through work. So they don't like it but they don't hate it. And 24% um, hate their work, fear it, despise it, loathe it. To the point of, that was the other thing that was interesting, to the point of being willing to sabotage their work and their co-workers. Yeah. Which is a quarter of the population. I mean, it's a staggering, you know, in the, in the, in the crude sort of economic man, uh, civil servant calculation, you would think that they would say, this is unproductive for the economy. Well, you're, so you are twice as likely to, almost twice as likely to hate your job as like your job in our mm -hmm. culture. And this, as you say, is the thing we do most of the time, right? The average British person answers the first email at 7, I think it's 7.43 a.m. and leaves work at 7.15 p.m. So we're, we're talking about this is the thing that dominates our lives and most people at best don't want to be there, right? So I started thinking, well, you know, could there be some connection between this and depression and anxiety, the epidemic of depression and anxiety? And I discovered there's an incredible guy who's done really the, the most important research on this, an Australian, extraordinary Australian social scientist called Michael Marmot in the 70s did the research on this. He actually stumbled into it kind of by accident. So what he wanted to figure out was who in an organisation is most likely to have a stress-related heart attack? And when he's, is it the guy, big boss at the top? Is it someone in the middle? Is it the people at the bottom, in inverted commas? And when he started doing this, people said, why are you even bothering to research? Obviously, the guy at the top is most likely to have a heart attack. He's, you know, got the most uh, responsibility. He's carrying the most load on his shoulders and so on. And so what Michael did is he spent, I think it was two and a half years studying the British Civil Service, this is in the early 70s, when it was a very, you know, the good thing about the British Civil Service is a good laboratory because, you know, there's no one going home to a damp home or is not in poverty, but, you know, you've got 19 layers uh, from the permanent secretary at the top to what... Uh, this is the and it doesn't change that much. It doesn't change that much, yeah, exactly. It's, you know, um, to, the, to the layer at the bottom. And um, 
And what he found was the exact opposite of what people expected. The lower you went, the more likely people were to have a heart attack. This is when he discovered what for us is important, which is that it was also, the same thing was true of depression. The lower you went, the more likely you were to become depressed. And he thought, well, what's going on here? So he did further research another couple of years, looking at people who worked at the same level of the civil service and saying, well, what varies? And is there therefore a corresponding variation that correlates with depression? Maybe we can figure out. And therefore he figured out he identified what it is in work that makes people depressed. The primary factor, it's not the only one, but the primary one, is a lack of control over your work. Human beings have an innate psychological need to feel that what we're doing is meaningful, that our life has meaning, right? And if you're spending most of your time just being controlled, it disrupts your ability to create meaning out of your work. And that correlates very strongly with depression. That is causing a lot of the depression in our culture. And at first when I learned about that, I actually found it, you know, cue up the little noise that people make when you say something ironic, I found it quite depressing because I thought, oh, I thought about a lot of the jobs that people in my family have done. You know, my grandmother scrubbed toilets, my, you know, there are going to be, um, you know, my mum worked in shelters for domestic violence, my, my dad was a bus driver, there are going to be unglamorous jobs. But actually I found it's not about, you know, fancy jobs versus, you know, actually, the, the, there's, there's a, remember the key factor is how much control you have, right? And so I spent some interesting time with this uh, amazing group of people in Baltimore. So there's a, a woman called Meredith Keogh. And Meredith um, used to go to bed every night on a Sunday night, just kind of thrumming with anxiety about the weekend. She had an office job. It wasn't the worst office job in the world. She wasn't being bullied or anything. But she just felt like shit. And one day Meredith quit her job and with her husband Josh. Uh, so Josh had worked in uh, bike stores in Baltimore since he was a teenager. And, you know, bike stores are you know, pretty insecure work, you're controlled, um, you, you know, yeah, people can guess the situation there. And one day Josh and his friends had this kind of uh, epiphany. They were like, what does the boss actually do? <laughs> they liked their boss, I and mean, he was a pretty bad boss, but they're like, well, we fix all the bikes, right? We seem to do all the work. So they decided they were gonna set up their own bike store based on a different principle. They didn't wanna be the boss, right? What they did is they set up a bike store based on the principle, it was a democratic cooperative. So the idea is they control it together, they make the big decisions together by voting, they share the good jobs and the bad jobs, they, um, you know, and they share the money, right? So they, they go from a very low autonomy workplace to a high autonomy workplace. And what's fascinating talking to them was how much, how, how many of them said we had been depressed and anxious before and that went away quite rapidly in this environment. It's not that they did, of course they still had challenges in life, mm -hmm. but there'd been a really significant fall in, in depression. And that absolutely fits with the scientific evidence that Professor Marmot found, which is, it, it, and it really important to understand, it's not like they went from, you know, working in a bike store to teaching surfing in the Florida Keys, right? They fixed bikes before they fixed bikes now. What changes, they went from low control to high control environment. And as Josh says, Josh who runs, it's called Baltimore Bicycle Works, it's a very thriving business. As Josh says, you know, there's no reason any business should be run this way. Imagine how differently people in Britain would feel about their work if tomorrow you knew that you were going into a workplace where you, you elect your boss and where it's democratically controlled and where you share the profits and you share the risks. And, you know, that's a very different attitude. It makes, uh, this is a slightly pretentious way of putting it, but it, it makes work more like the participative tribes that we evolved to live in rather than these authoritarian control workplaces. Now, I would say... That shift that Josh and Meredith and everyone at Baltimore Bicycle went through, went through is an antidepressant, right? We should expand the concept of an antidepressant to be anything that makes people less depressed and anxious. Right. For thousands of years, philosophers have said, if you think life is about status and ego and money, uh, you're going to feel like shit, right? That's, that's not the exact words Confucius <laughs> used, but you know, it's pretty close. Sure. Um, yeah. But weirdly, no one had ever scientifically investigated this until this amazing guy I got to know, Professor Tim Kasser at Illinois State University. Um, and and what, what Professor Kasser did, um, I think is really revelatory in terms of what it reveals about depression and anxiety and needs to be discussed much more. So social scientists before him had identified that there were essentially uh, two different, crudely, there are two kinds of motives for human beings, right? And we're all a mixture of both. So if you imagine you play the piano, if you play the piano because you love it and it gives you a sense of joy, so you're doing it just for the pleasure of the act itself, that's an intrinsic motivation, right? You're intrinsically connected to the act. 
if you play the piano in order to impress a woman so she'll have sex with you or you know, piano fetishist or or you know in a dive bar to to pay the rent or because your parents want you to be a piano maestro or whatever that would be an extrinsic reason so you're not doing it for the thing in itself you're doing it for external reasons external things to the act itself and what Tim has, has shown, I think is fascinating. So Tim did this, has done enormous amount of research, but one of the things he did, for example, is just follow people over, follow people to see how do you feel when you achieve an intrinsic goal compared to how when you achieve an extrinsic goal. What it turns out is when you achieve an extrinsic goal, getting a promotion, you know, earning more money, you don't experience any increase in satisfaction at all, none, right? When you achieve an intrinsic goal, like being a better dad, being a better son, being a better writer, whatever, um, you do experience a significant increase in satisfaction. And what we've, what we've done, the, and, and, and so anyway, subsequently there's been 22 different studies that have shown the more you are driven by extrinsic motives, the more likely you are to be depressed and anxious. And there's a very interesting idea that materialistic people are much less likely to have flow states. So that those moments of writing or walking where you feel a deep, deep connection, which is one of the things that you talk about that, that derealization has taken away from us. Well, just to say about that, and it's important for people to understand why. So if you think about, um, if you're playing the piano, right? And you dissolve into the process and you have that wonderful, I, mean, I don't play the piano, so I don't say this, but I get this in writing. And you know, every, people, everyone has, you know, most people have flow states, something they get a flow state from, where you, you, you lose your sense of time and you dissolve into it and you just feel this completeness in your consciousness. Um, so imagine if you're someone who got that from the piano, then imagine that you, you so then imagine you, you have an extrinsic motive on top of that. Maybe you start going, am I the best piano player in London? How are other people thinking about this piano playing? Um, so you get jo extrinsic values jolters out of flow states. This isn't the only, this isn't the only or the main reason why, why extrinsic values correlate so strongly with depression and anxiety, but it's, it's one of them. We all know that junk food appeals to the part of us that evolved to need food, but doesn't give us nutrition, right? Mm. In a very similar way, I think junk values have hijacked our minds and made us mentally sick. And we live in a culture that is absolutely geared towards uh, getting us to think in this way. So there's a little little experiment that I think is a lovely illustration of this. It was done in 1978, not by Professor Kasser, by some other social scientists. So uh, it's very simple. They get groups of five-year-olds and they split them into two groups. And group A is shown an advert for two, two sorry, two adverts for a toy, a specific toy. And second group isn't shown any ads. And at the end, they say to all the kid five-year-olds, okay, you've got a choice now. You can either play with a really nice boy who doesn't have the toy you've just seen advertised, could play with a boy who's not very nice, but he's got the toy. The kids who've seen the ads choose the nasty boy who's got the toy. The kids who haven't seen the ads choose the nice boy. So what you think is just two adverts have primed them to choose an inanimate lump of plastic over a possibility of a meaningful human connection. Now that is playing out the ho Anyone, you know, watching this who's chosen to stay at work longer rather than go home and play with their kids because they want to buy an expensive car or something, that dynamic is playing out with us the whole time. We are, we are constant, as, as uh, Professor Kassa says, we live under a system that is constantly getting us to neglect what is really valuable in life, what really makes us feel good. And I was thinking about this the other day with a, this, I don't mean this as a cheap point, because it's not a cheap point. There was an interview with Melania Trump before she became the first lady, when she was speaking at NYU. I can't imagine why. It was long before the election campaign. And a student asked her, would, would you have married Donald Trump if he wasn't rich? And she smiled and said, do you think he would have married me if I wasn't beautiful? And to me, that reveals this wider madness in our culture. Because think about what that means, rather like we're saying about flow states. Think about what that, that's going to tell you about their relationship. So Melania Trump's knows if she gets fat, if she got yeah. mauled in an accident, if she, she's out, right? And Donald Trump knows if he loses his money. Now think about what that relationship is going to be like versus a relationship where you know someone loves you for you and values you intrinsically and thinks that you're a great person, right? So if you're pushed towards these extrinsic surfaces, I think that's a good illustration of why being pushed towards extrinsic surfaces makes you uh, feel significantly worse. And these junk values are really big drivers of, of this depression. And the, the book's called Lost Connections. You've already mentioned social media a bit. I'm very intrigued by this because a lot of people feel they're more connected than ever. Yeah. They can communicate to a massive audience uh, in a way in which was previously inconceivable. Um, but that social media isn't necessarily part of the solution, it's part of the problem. So the internet arrives in the late 90s. And if you look at a lot of the trends we're talking about, they'd actually 
really begun significantly before that. They'd really um, exploded before that. So massive fall in the amount of social connections and close friends people have before the internet. Uh, huge rise in junk values before the internet. Huge rise in disconnection from the natural world before the internet. And what happens is the internet appears and it's like a kind of parody of the thing we've lost, right? It's close enough, I would just I would compare the relationship between social media and social life to the relationship between pornography and sex, right? I'm not against pornography, and if you give pornography to a sex-starved person, they're gonna get something out of it, but they're not gonna feel the way they feel after they've had sex, right? You don't feel held and valued and sated the way you do after, no one feels like that after they've had a wank, right? That, it's, you, you, know, you don't get anything out of it, I'm not against it, but it's not, and I think in a similar way, uh, I'm not against social media either, but it's, so Hillary said, and this is so interesting, so a, a disproportionate amount of the people they get there are young men. Uh, and they've often become, so some of the patients I met when I, when I was there, um, were people who become obsessed with multiplayer video games like World of Warcraft. Um, and she said, well, what are these young men getting out of these video games? They're getting precisely the things the culture doesn't give them, right? They're getting a sense of a tribe and a, and a community they get a sense of status. They get a sense of like rules where they know how they can rise. Um, so these, they get a sense of adventure. I mean, a lot of these kids, it was an incredible study that found the average British child spends less time outdoors than the average maximum security prisoner. Because by law, I think maximum security prisoners have to have whatever it is, an hour and 15 minutes. Most kids don't even get that, right? So you're talking about kids who've been raised as literally worse than prisoners, right? So we've ended up in a culture where we have status updates instead of status. We have Facebook friends instead of friends. We have online connections instead of connections. And it, Professor John Cassiopo, who's one of the leading experts in the world on, on, um, on loneliness, he's at the University of Chicago, said to me, uh, I thought framed it best, when social media is a way station to connections in the world, then it's a great thing. When it's your final destination on the stop, then you're going to have real, real problems. And there's all this evidence that's emerged. Susan Pink, Dr. Susan Pinko, who I interviewed in Montreal, is very interesting on this, about you know, Facebook depression. Mm -hmm. And the longer you spend on Facebook, the more likely you are to go depressed. And it's partly what you said right when we started up this question before I gave this monstrously long answer, which is another factor that's going on is it drives you towards extrinsic values. And you, and you speak actually about this phenomenon in the West with homesickness, even at home. Yeah, there's this beautiful uh, Sarah Silverman, the comedian. Yeah. It's very interesting. Sarah Silverman, I really recommend her um, her memoir, uh, uh, Memoirs of a Bedwetter, but also her, well, she describes this, this this childhood and she has, she, she said, I don't think she says it in the book, I think she said it in an interview but uh, with someone else, but she she's talking about when she was like 12 or 13 and she became really, really depressed. Mm. And she she's trying to describe what it felt like and she said to her stepfather, well, it's like when I go to camp and I'm homesick, but I'm at home. And I thought that was such a beautiful, and actually when you understand this different way of thinking about home, and one of the things I think this is very interesting politically, the only people who talk about home in politics are the far right yeah. and environmentalists. Obviously I'm on the side of environmentalists, not on the side of the far right, but I think we need to develop a vocabulary for talking about home, right? Think about how, I mean, I remember when we talked a lot during the French campaign about when uh, Marine Le Pen would, would, would talk about, um, you know, I think France is our home and Macron thinks France is a warehouse, right? right? Yeah. And there were disastrous moments when actually people seemed to accept that framing and I was like, no, we need to, if the only people talking about home are the far right, that's going to really help them, right? We, we, human beings have an innate need for a home, a place we belong. We, actually, that sense has been really lacking in our culture. That's something we need to really meet. And that's a very good insight uh, on which to end. Thank you very much. Hugh. Hooray, I enjoyed that, Ben. Thanks Thank very much. You. Oh, just I was getting I was getting uh, intrigued there. I just basically almost forgot to uh, turn the camera back on. I was replying to a comment from Gary. Um, super, super interesting chat, and it's why I want to get Johan on uh, for an act on this TV podcast because we can we can start talking about this and how it relates to the acts industry. I made an absolute ton of notes there. It's the second time I've watched that interview. I'm going to go through a few of them with you now because I just think the acting industry. God, like plays into everything he was talking about there more than more than probably most industries, to be honest, on you know on Earth. <laughs> I think it's a pretty unique industry you work in, and I think it plays into everything to do with vulnerabilities around 
mental health and depression if you're not careful. Um, Ina says that energy is amazing, his enthusiasm is infectious. Got to get him, uh, get him on for a podcast. Uh, Larry says he's great. So a couple of interesting things. Like I said, I've made sheets of, of notes here, but I'll just recap a few because I know it's late. 65 to 80% of people who are depressed... Um, and then our, our prescribed medication, synthetic hormones like serotonin, become depressed again within 12 months. So that, for me, proves like it's just putting a bandage over it. You've got to change your action. If you're feeling bad, like we said at the beginning, it's your body's way of saying, wait a minute here, something isn't right. If you're feeling low all the time, you're anxious, you, you're really upset all the time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you're not fulfilled in your work, in your job, in your life, in your relationship. It's not a matter of going, right, let's just mask over it with this stuff that's just going to make us feel better temporarily. Um, it's a matter of saying, okay, I've got to listen to this and change up what's going on. Um, Johan likened it there to, to a doctor saying, look, okay, you're, you're, a, you're a human with a broken part. Your brain's broken as opposed to you're a human being with unmet needs. And I think that's a much healthier way of looking at it going, what needs right now? of mine are not being met, you know, my need for certainty, variety, significance, love, connection, you know, um, feeling valued, worthy, talented, all these needs we have as human beings, as opposed to going, here, pop a pill, you'll feel better. Um, so yeah, he says that depression is a necessary signal that something needs to change. And I, I saw all the comments, there's so many comments on that, people just going, God, I agree with this so much, so much, you know, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's going on um, in this video. All right, Kelvin, Kelvin's here, but everyone was saying, um, you know, that they were agreeing with what Johan was saying there. The part that resonated with me the most, particularly for the acts industry, is meaningful work. And I think as creatives, and I, I God, I know this because I freaking lived it, Going back to like, I don't know how many years ago it was now, but like 2006, probably what we're looking at, like 13 years ago, where I was working in game, the computer game shop. Those who have done Bulletproof Factor, I go through my entire life story up until that point and how that got me to the point where I was like, I was feeling bad, like shit had to change. Now for me, I had a massive, two massive things happen in my life around that time. I found out I was losing my eyesight um, and my dad died instantly of a heart attack. That was a catalyst for me to go, fucking hell, what are you doing with your life? Like literally, you know, you're working 40 hours a week in this shop, hating your life. You feel you have no control because of your, you know, I was completely in a structure of bosses. God, it was even really difficult to get out for auditions. The odd time I would get an audition. Now, this was post-drama school as well. I just spent 15 grand, which is nothing compared to what you've got to spend these days at drama school. Uh, but we're talking many, many years ago. Um you know, I'd, I'd graduated drama school. I was getting like the odd audition now and again, but even getting out of work for that was a struggle. Um, so I had no control. He says 13% of people, that's a staggering, staggeringly small number, only 13% of people um, apparently like their work that they are in. 60, what's that? 63% of people are sleepwalking through their work. So they don't like it or they don't not like it. They're just like, yeah all right, going to do it, got to do it. And 24% uh, of people actively hate their work to a point where they will sabotage it for themselves or other people. Um, lack of control is, a, is the biggest reason people don't like their work. We need to feel that life has meaning. And when we can't control our work, we can't find that meaning a lot of the time. That for me is the biggest thing in that interview. In terms of as an actor, that's the thing that I just don't think... 99% of actors feel they have is control of their career or just control of like how they're going to earn money in general, how they're going to survive and then chase their passion. And I, and just looking back at like when I suddenly became so much more fulfilled in my life was when I sacked off that job for minimum wage in that retail job, you know, and it took a year to transition out of that. I started building acts on this, you know, we're now eight years into acts on this now. Um, it's certainly not, you know, been an easy ride, but like now it's established um, as a decent platform, it's led to lots of opportunities for me um, and control for me in my work. Um, I got heavily into voiceover, which is an area I, you know I feel I can control. Um, when I brought control into my life and I took control of my career, my acting career, that was when suddenly all those shitty feelings that I used to have, you know, and like I don't know if I, I don't, don't think I was clinically depressed, but God, I was going out on a weekend every weekend running away from my life, going out most nights, drinking, um, anything to escape the monotony of those four walls in that shop because I didn't have any control. And then when I took control, 
everything changed. So if you're in a job right now that you're like, God, I absolutely hate this, and you feel there is no way out and you've got to do it because, like, oh, I just need it to survive. Trust me, like, there is a way out. I found a way out. You've got to look at something else that you've got in your life that you can create, you know, your own business around. Look at the boys that you talked about who ran that bike shop. They were working underneath someone else. They were great at their job, but they weren't happy because they had no control. Then one day they realized, wait a minute, what does the boss here do? Why don't we just set up our own democratic bike shop where we're the bosses, we share the profits, we share the good jobs and the bad jobs, um, you know, create that tribe, that community within, you know, within the organization. What are you doing right now for someone else where actually your boss is bringing no value to that thing? You could do that on your own if you could set it up and get over the fear that might be holding you back from ever doing that. Anyone in that situation now where you're like, God, like I'm actually, I'm really quite skilled at something that I'm doing that isn't acting, but I'm building someone else's dream. And really, I could implement this into my own business and build my own dream alongside my acting career that's just going to fill me up so much more. And you've got to have something else that isn't acting as well. If you've just got acting, you are resigning yourself to a life of uncertainty and lack of control unless you get so established you can create your own production company and then completely control um, the way shit's going for you. I noticed Sheridan Smith this week is opening Barking, no, Barking Mad. Yeah, I think it's Barking Mad, our own production company. A lot of big names, once they've been established, can do that. But at this point in your career where you're at, it's probably not possible. Until then, what can you create that is just your own, that you can have full control over? Um it's really interesting. And then that point that they, that he talks about, about just basing your self-worth and your value on extrinsic bullshit, trust me, it doesn't work. I've told you loads and loads of times. Um, I've spoken to so many people who have won BAFTAs, who have won Oscars, um, you know, who have won RTS awards, Emmy awards, you know, the biggest accolades you can get in the acting industry. And every single one of them, and I promise you, every single one of them, most have said it on record when I've interviewed them, that they got that accolade and they're like, uh, doesn't make them happy. It's an extrinsic goal. They get it and they go, oh God, well actually I've realized that the thing that was making me intrinsically happy on the inside was the process, the creative journey and making something that didn't exist before I decided to make it, i.e. the script or the film, whatever it is they're doing. Um, when you realize that actually that should be your aim, not that you need accolades and, and you know paparazzi taking your picture and being in you know magazines and shit, doesn't make you happy. Otherwise, very, very famous, successful people would not take their own lives, you know. Um, it's fascinating. Let's see what comments we've got. Absolutely about meaningful work, says Dougal. I left a, um, a what, a perm? You didn't leave a perm, Dougal. You've not got a perm. What do you mean? A, oh, a permanent well-paid job <laughs> to pursue an acting career, the best decision I ever made. Um, Larry says, grief is a huge issue. You need to feel and accept rather than pop a pill. Yeah. Absolutely, but sometimes it can be chemical, but it's rare. I'm not, and I'm definitely not saying that, you know, some people might not have a predisposition to low levels of serotonin, dopamine, you know, um, what are the other, uh, oxytocin, um, you know, other good feel-good chemicals. That certainly, you know, uh, through diet and stuff could really, really be uh, true and an accurate reflection of what's going inside their head. Maybe genetically they're predisposed, uh, predisposed to low, I can't speak tonight, to low levels of those chemicals. But I just think popping a pill is just not the answer. I think when you can change your life and you can get all of your needs as a human being met by meaningful work, you just become kind of unstoppable in a way. Um, and I think that's what we all need to embrace, you know, particularly what we're doing here as well as in Acts on This, you know, I mean, look what we're doing tonight, you know, in terms of that community, um, we've really got a fantastic community here. So in terms of the tribe, and it was interesting them talking about social media saying, you know, we have, you know, Facebook friends as opposed to real friends. Um, but Johan was saying that, you know, social media is fantastic if it's a, a, like, you know, it's it's something you're using to get to your destination in terms of we all hook up on here on a Monday night live or if you're listening on the audio experience, you're listening on Spotify or whatever. But hopefully we meet at some point, you know, you'll come to an act on this meetup, I'll see you in an event, you know, I met Dougal when he was shooting a film, met him at a, a screening. I met loads of people here at the Acts on This meetups we have, um, you know, the first Saturday of every month in Manchester and London. Um, it can't be like the final destination where you're just on Facebook and you have loads of friends but feel like actually you have no connection. Um, but in this community, I think, you know, we've kind of got that 
down a bit better where we do you know do things in the real world not just uh, not just online um, Valerie says my phone keeps cutting off after watch the replay interesting discussion sorry Valerie hopefully it looks like it's all right for me now we were struggling at nine o'clock tonight but um, hopefully technology wise we're okay now Bobby says I felt that age 22 25. It's one of the most depressing signs of life. Normally people have just left college and now gone into full-time work and having to live as adults for the first time. Um, a lot of people don't take it well. For me personally, it was going, is this all there is to life? Probably because you went into a job, Bobby, you felt you had no control over, dude. Uh, which is what 99, well, it's not what 99% do, according to that that poll. What was it? 63% of sleepwalking, um, another 24%. So a massive 87% of people ultimately don't like their work or actively hate it. 87% of people. And you've got one freaking life. Look, Keith Flint died today. Um, I just um, saw before, what's his name? Um, Luke Perry has died today. Keith was 49, Luke was 52. Both wildly successful in the grand scheme of things. Happy? I don't know. No clue. Don't know how fulfilled they were. Don't know whether they, you know, felt they were doing meaningful work and they were super in control of it. They probably were. I guess they had a lot of success. Um, but still, I mean, look at that. Died so freaking young. I thought my dad died young. He died at 60. That's so ridiculously young. If you are fannying around in a job and you're one of those 87% of people who does not like what you are doing or actively freaking hates it... You've got to ask yourself some serious questions tonight and this week and go, actually, you know what? Why do I feel I've got no control? Am I bringing loads to the table just to build someone else's dream where I could just bring it to my own table, set up my own company on the side when I get home from work? Forget your nine till five. Give it to your job that you're doing at the moment if that's what you've got to do to survive. Then use your five till nine to build your own business. And then eventually that five till nine can turn into your nine till five. And then you've got all the time in the world to you know go after your acting career. Audition create your own work and take control, not just wait for agents and casting directors to give you a call. That's another thing so many actors do that I think is leading to this depression that everyone's feeling. Because I, like Johan, don't believe that suddenly, you know, hundreds of people in the acting industry, which in the grand scheme of things is quite small compared to what everyone else does, you know, all the regular jobs out there. I don't believe hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people in the acting industry suddenly have all been born with a predisposition to low levels of serotonin in the brain. I think that's bullshit. I think it's society. It's the industry as a whole that is doing this. And it feels like for most actors, they have no control. They're at the mercy of casting directors, the mercy of agents. They can't do anything without anyone else. And that is simply not true. The people I see who are killing it right now in this industry, who have won those accolades... Um, have taken full control themselves. Look at people like, you know, Rachel Shenton won the Oscar. Look at people like Noel Clark, Ashley Walters. Um, you know, look at these people who are uh, creating their own work and just and just showing people that, like, you know, you can prove people wrong. Ultimately, people who are like, no, that will never work. They just go, well, you know what? If you're not going to back it, I'm going to go and do it myself. And then they prove it works. And those people are like, shit, like, why did I not? Why did I not go with that? Um, you can do, you are so much, ultimately the message tonight is you are so much more capable than you uh, you probably think you are. Rachel's back. How are you doing, Rach? Um, hope you're good. Um, Sharon says, I can never make the Manchester meetups owing to work commitments. Well, Sharon, let's look at your job. If you're in the 13% of people who like their job and you're doing it on a Saturday, stick at it. Or maybe give yourself a Saturday off. If you're in the 84% or whatever it was of people, 87%, 87% what? Yeah, 87% of people who actively hate their work, um, look at a way of getting out and come to one of these meetups. Join the tribe. Um, you know, it would be uh, great to see you. Kelvin says I must get myself to the next London meetup. The meetups are going so well. We're getting like lots of turnout, and they're just really positive, um, helpful meetings. It's not like we just sit around and just drink coffee. We do that, but we actively talk to um we go around the table like if there's like 25 30 of us and everybody says what they're doing in their career right now where they want to be in 30 days and then we all as a collective say right how can we together help you get there so when you come back to the meetup the next month you will have achieved that goal and you can set a new one uh, and we're going to hold you accountable as well um so uh so please yeah come to the meetups uh, if you've never been to one you listen on the replay or you're watching the replay it's first saturday of every month i host the one at home theater in manchester 11 a.m till 2 p.m although they go on for a bit longer uh, wendy and mel host the one in london at bfi south bank Benugo bar 11 till whenever it goes on till first saturday of every month wendy even brings cookies get involved um definitely 
Um, I'm an actor who can dance, and now I teach dance between acting jobs, so I call it my uh, vacation teaching. Nice one, Chris. Um, yeah, everyone's got that thing that they can offer, um, definitely. So, um, so yeah, just have a think this week. Have a little think. If you are in that 87% of people, you know, the, the fact is we've already mentioned Keith died today, and so has Luke. Two people in the arts, creatives, very young. Um, what what the media doesn't report is that actually 150,000 people died today across the globe. So if you wake up tomorrow morning, literally just because you are here, you've beaten 150,000 people who, who woke up this morning and will not wake up tomorrow morning. I hope everyone on here wakes up tomorrow morning. Everyone listening wakes up tomorrow morning, whenever tomorrow is for you. But that's the reality of it. Don't work a job or accept that you're feeling low and you're just depressed and then mask that shit with fake hormones. It's not about that. It's about changing your circumstance, realizing what human needs of yours are not being met and actually acting on it. Act on this. Um, act on it um, to change it because you can change it when you start questioning things. Um, so it's powerful. We will look at a bit more Lost Connections in a couple of weeks on the next book club. I think it's a really, really valuable book. Um, if you want to tweet Johan, um, look him up on Twitter. Tell him to do a podcast with me. I'm definitely going to be tweeting him. We'll do a podcast with him. I'd love to do a podcast with him. He's just such an articulate bloke, um, which will be, uh, will be very, very cool, hopefully. Uh, we'll get him on. Um, and yeah, what I want to do, a little update just before we go. Um, I've put a podcast out. For those who are premium members of that's on this.tv, put a brand new podcast out for you in the members area this morning, uh, which if I go over to the website is here. If you click on what's new, top corner there, you'll find this brand new podcast, Seven Steps to Showreel Success with top showreel producer, Mr. Chris Stone. Um, if you're not a member, you can listen to a preview there. It's 10 minutes long. Um, Chris is literally the UK's premier showreel producer. I won't let anybody else edit my reel. I've shot showreel scenes with this guy. I've started in web series he's done. He's one of the most talented men I've ever met in this industry. I sat down with him where I am right now and we recorded an hour and 34 minute podcast on everything this guy knows about showreels. Seven steps that will transform your reel into a reel that I promise you if you follow these steps will get you castings, will lead to auditions. After that, it's down to you to get the job. Um, but it's it's so invaluable. Listen to it and get a pen and piece of paper um, and write down as many notes as you can in that. Um, if you're not a premium member, go to actsonthis.tv forward slash seven days and get a free trial for seven days, okay? You'll have to put your credit card information in. It's 10 quid a month if you decide to carry on after seven days. But if you don't um, like what you see, which you will, it's hundreds of hours worth of interviews on here with the biggest people in the bloody industry. Um, actors, writers, ca uh, casting directors, agents, producers, um, everybody, some of the biggest names in the industry. Um, if you don't like it, you can literally cancel within seven days on your own from the members area. You don't have to ring anyone or anything like that, no bullshit, and you won't be charged a penny, basically. I can't make it fairer than that, but for £2.50 a week, you will not find names like you've got on the front page here anywhere else offering you the advice they offer you. I can't stress enough. If you're feeling like shit and you're in a job you don't want to do, Get a membership, listen to this, act on it, on all the advice these top people are giving you, and shit will change for you very, very quickly. Nothing is going to change if you resign yourself to this is just the way it is. Because it isn't. You can absolutely do something about your situation. If you're not feeling good, let's, you know, let's actually work to change it. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to play you a 60-second clip of the uh, podcast with Chris that I just showed you there. Just one little tiny piece of advice on showreels that even this on its own is valuable. You might be doing what he talks about in your reel right now, and you don't want to be doing this thing we're going to talk about right now. Um, you'll find out what that is in a second. Anyone got any, uh, any closing comments? And I just want to say thank you again so much for... Um, for the patience you showed me tonight, for like I thought at nine o'clock when it all went wrong, I was like, oh, I'm going to lose the audience tonight, but I'm going to follow through with it anyway. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be defeated by technology. And you've all stuck around, so I appreciate it so much. Dawn says a very important topic raised tonight, Ross, especially in the acting industry. I believe at, at least ninety percent of actors feel depressed at certain times in their lives. I think a hundred percent of human beings feel depressed. At, you know, at, 
at multiple times in their life, Dawn, completely. I think as actors, we're no different to any other human being. We're not special in any other way. Um, but I think our industry particularly breeds feelings of low self-esteem, anxiety, and, you know, it sounds it sounds quite extreme, but yeah, depression. And I'm not talking necessarily, like we say, like mad, crazy clinical depression where people are suicidal. I just think a lot of people are walking around very, very sad, not feeling enough, valuing extrinsic bullshit and awards and titles and accolades and pictures in magazines, as opposed to the creative process and feeling fulfilled that they are actually just enjoying the journey. Um, and I think they're not putting themselves in situations where they feel they have any control because this industry, if you listen to, do you know what? A lot of people, I'll just be completely honest, right? I've probably not said this many times and I hope, and, and I can guarantee you acts on this is not one of those things. God, I'm asking people for £2.50 a week for a membership that we donate to charity. Um, well, a lot of the, a lot of the membership fees go to charity. If the guests, the guests get a charity donation basically when they do an interview with me, but there are a lot of people in this industry who don't want to give you control. And they don't want to give you control because they want to sell you shit. So your acting coaches, people who will sell you masterclasses, people who will take hundreds of pounds off you for a weekend workshop, they don't want to tell you, actually, you know what, here's how you take control of your career. You know what, this industry is not as hard as you're probably making it out. You know, maybe you're overthinking how difficult it is when it's not. Actually, if you look at it practically, they want to tell you it's as hard as possible, that hardly anybody makes it because they want to sell you their bullshit and that because they're not making enough in their own career, if they were actors and they decided that they failed, so they go into selling workshops and selling all this stuff, promising you guys success that they never had. That's why the day I stop working as an actor, Act On This will not exist because I am not running a community that's helping actors have more success when I'm not experiencing that myself. And luckily, touch wood, up to now, I'm working on TV every couple of months and I'm working as a voiceover artist every couple of days. Um, stuff is good. And that's only because I am acting on the knowledge that I get producing these interviews. So like, it's not that I'm doing something I'm not telling you guys about it. I hope you realize I'm sharing everything with you that is making a difference in my life. You know, everything. And that's why I do these broadcasts on a Monday night. I want to give you everything because I'm like, there's enough for all of us. I'm not like, oh, you know, you will have to pay extra money if you want my secret stuff, but I'm just going to give away all this shit for free. No, giving away the best stuff I have um, and bringing you guys into the community. So yeah, um, people don't want you to have control, but I promise you, you can take more control than you probably think. Um, London Meet up for me, says Valerie. Excellent, Angie's here in the house. Just got my draft show reel back from Chris today. Awesome, Angie. I hope that's good. Post it in the Facebook group. Let's have a, uh, have a watch of that. Um, I want Chris to do a scene for me, says Rachel. He's a good guy. Listen to this this afternoon, says Gemma. It was epic in capital letters. Thank you, Gemma. Thanks so much to you and Chris. Made so many notes. Now to action. Um, Honestly, it's like literally we distilled down what Chris has spent probably the best part of a decade of his life learning. We distilled it down to 94 minutes. Um, You will need to take notes, but it is uh, is a very, very valuable podcast for that. Virtual hug to all, says uh, Lowry. Lowry, Lowry. Stu says, thanks. All right, thank you, Stu. Thanks, Dougal. Um, thanks, Kelvin. Appreciate you being here, my man. Um, Dawn, thank you. Sharon, thank you. Um, awesome. Well, I will. Um, I'll love you and leave you guys. I'm going to play. Like I say, I'm going to play uh, a 60 second clip of Chris's podcast if I can get it lined up for you here. Um, and uh, yeah, if I can do anything for anybody, drop me a an email or a tweet at Ross A. Grant uh, at Acts on This TV. Uh, you can email uh, ross at acts on this tv um i do try and get back to people as soon as i possibly can sometimes it can take up to a week i think um but the majority of the time yeah i will uh you know what twitter's better if you want to if you want to get a really quick reply from me tweet me at ross a grant i go on twitter every single day and i can write you know i can at least give you 280 characters or whatever <laughs> whatever you get on twitter um definitely um also within acts on this.tv as well uh, if you get a premium membership if i just uh if i show you here i've shown you this last week haven't i but um if you want to ask questions and get a load of feedback from the community and maybe they're sensitive questions as well when you log in to the members area see how you've got this premium community here now this blue one 
click on this. Sorry, there's on the audio experience. I'm just showing you the inside of ads on this. There's now this community that we have here, which is very similar to Facebook, how it works. Um, but it's uh, it's incredibly private and locked away just for premium members. So if you've got stuff you want to ask about agents, for example, or stuff you don't want to put out publicly in the Facebook group, that's absolutely the uh, the place to do it. Um, but you've got to get premium membership to be part of that. But like I say, actsonlist.tv forward slash seven days, get a seven day trial. No, it's 10 quid a month. It's a freaking bargain. Uh, right, I'm going to play you this little clip from Chris. I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you so much for being here. Go get yourself to bed. Tony, if you're in Chicago and you're watching, get yourself, uh, get some action, get some action happening. Um, go take control of your career. Let's get everyone feeling good. I'll be back next Monday with some more. Until then, peace out. Love you all. Bye for now. Sometimes people put on the text of the clips. So, you know, play a clip and they'll have Coronation Street in the bottom left-hand corner or the director's name or something like that. You don't really need to do that because if somebody's reading text, then they're not watching the performance. And the whole point of the reel is to show off your acting, not to list all your credits. Because you can do that on Spotlight. The other thing that limits you with is sometimes you could take two scenes from the same film that look completely different so it kind of creates the illusion that you've been in more stuff but if you're putting names to it every time it comes on screen it's like oh well actually that's really obvious now it's all from the same thing